Oh. Thanks for joining us today. It's National Pollinator Week in support of Pollinator Health here. So we're celebrating these amazing little bees that make the world go round. Not only the European honeybee we see, but all of the native bees in the world and other pollinators, bats, butterflies, you name it. We need them. We need them to do their amazing pollination, which really does connect all of the, the, the species. It, it does the really important work of spreading the DNA around and without it, we'd lose one third of our food types and not only that, we would lose uh, a whole lot of species being able to reproduce. So thank you for joining us. Today, we're having a look at the hive we harvested last week. And if you look in the window here of this, uh, this is our Aracaria hive and this is our Flow Hive Classic. And you can see in the window, the frame we've harvested, the bees have actually chewed all of the wax capping away. They've recycled that wax, they've reformed the cells. And as soon as there's a good nectar flow, they'll be ready to go again. So it's amazing to be able to watch that experience. But what we're going to do to even get a better look at that is I'm gonna show you how to inspect the flow frames. So what we're going to do is pull this roof off, pull the inner cover off and just pull that frame out. Not because we need to, but just out of interest to see what's going on in the hive. So I've got my smoker here and uh, I've been filling it full of pine needles this morning. Pine needles are, are not a bad um, thing to light a smoker with. They don't last that long, but they're really easy to light. So let's get our smoker going. We've already lit it at the bottom. We just need to puff it a bit till it gets going again. And we, what we want to see is nice, cool smoke blowing out. You don't want flames coming out or anything like that. You want it to be reasonably cool to touch. And smoking your hands is not a bad idea to help mask your pheromone so your bees less likely to go, hang on, there's a, uh, there's a mammal, there's a bear coming to uh, get my honey. So uh, we mask that pheromone like that. I'm going to put my um, bee veil on as well and sticking the nose right in the entrance of the hive, giving it a couple of good puffs and I'll leave the smoker right in front here, which then when the forager bees return, they'll get a whiff of smoke and that helps to calm them. If you've got questions, put it in the comments below. We're all about helping people answer, uh, helping people get their questions answered so they can get started in this fascinating world of beekeeping. Look at all those bees coming home, isn't that beautiful? They're just kind of hovering there. I think the, the smoke and the smoke is something different and they're just pausing in the air before they land. If you watch carefully, you'll get to see them coming in with pollen on their hind legs. They do this amazing, there's one there, they do this amazing pollen collecting effort where as they come to the flower, the pollen grains actually jump off them because the bees are statically charged and the bees are covered in little hairs. Even their eyeballs are covered in hairs. Then what they do is they scrape all that pollen down to their pollen baskets on their hind legs and they'll fly back to the hive, usually with enough pollen and nectar to almost equal their body weight. So it's an incredible feat. Sometimes they'll be flying 10 kilometers or six miles. I don't know how they do it, but they do. They seem to defy the laws of physics to do that. Now, when they get back to the hive, they fly in the front and that pollen, they will actually scrape off their hind legs and then push it into the cells with their heads and they'll pack it down at their special sauce and ferment it into a, a beautiful uh, bee bread. It's like a sourdough. When humans ferment things like sourdough bread, it's easier to digest for us. It's the same for the bees. So they're very industrious with their bread making. Any questions coming through as I start this process of uh, taking some of these flow frames out. Yes, so lots of people tuning in from all around the world, even tons in Tanzania, um, having everyone look, loving these weekly videos. Um, so they're just wondering about an inspection of the brood hive. How often would you inspect this through winter? Okay, so here where we are, we don't really get a winter as far as the European honeybee is concerned because we don't have snow, we don't have that long cold winter. And you can even see we're, we're in our winter now and the, there's things flowering um, everywhere. So we actually get good honey flows in the winter. 
but if you're in a place that does get long cold winters, there's no flowers, then uh, refrain from doing your brood inspections in the winter. What you want to do is look after your bees just prior to winter. If they don't have enough food, then you'd feed them and let them build up a bit of stores because they need that to last through a long time with no flowers. That's why they store honey. So you might also pack your hive down to, if you've got multiple boxes to a, a smaller hive that's more right sized for the colony. Taking the excluder out, which sits in between these two boxes is a good idea allows the queen to roam free, which is uh, important if the brood nest is moving around the hive to consume the honey. You don't want the queen stuck behind and perishing. So a few things there for, for winter, but it really does depend. Ask your local beekeepers what you need to do to prepare for winter. But once you've prepared the colony, you just leave it. And when uh, you get some sunny warm days again, the first ones uh, heading towards spring, then you can open up and see how they've gone. You might start feeding them at that point if you want to. Uh, we don't need to feed here but in, in many places people do choose to feed their bees and then off they go again for the next spring. So the answer to your question is in the cold places you won't be inspecting in the winter. Okay, so next what we're going to do is take the, the roof off this hive and then we're going to take the, uh, the top box completely off now. I'm not sure whether the bees are in this roof. Oh, there's our shelf oh. brackets. We were looking for them. <laughs> <laughs> Very nice. We, we, we need them for, the, uh, for um, putting the brood uh, frames on. So they double really nicely as a shelf bracket. So you just take, uh, just back out one of your screws here like this. And um, then the, the easiest way I find to click them on is you start sideways like that. And there's a keyhole here, right? So it'd be that way, then that way, over the screw head, then that way, then turn it into position and you want it tight, not all wobbly. So you can adjust your screw. And this one looks a bit tight, so I'm going to adjust that screw there with the handy tool that comes with the hives. And here we go. So this will come out there like that. And then I can adjust that in a position, making sure it's nice and firm because you don't want your brood frames falling off if you're using that for a frame rest. So that's cool. Next we're going to open this rear window. Now, I don't think there's a lot of honey in there at the moment, as you can see, because the bees are a bit hungry right now, hoping for a bit of a flow of nectar soon. Okay, now we can take that roof right off like that put that aside and we're going to take the inner cover off here we go but first of all we're going to ha have a look at one of the flow frames and then we're going to move on to the brood so i'm having a look here just out of habit but i don't need to because there's an excluder so the queen's not going to be up here unless something's wrong little hive beetle there Small hive beetles uh, are in a lot of people's hives in a lot of countries. Started off from Africa and made their way around the world. And uh, they're not really a problem unless the colony gets weak. Here's, here's one here. I'll see if I can get it to go out into the sunlight. That's the way they like to follow along an edge. There we go. Little black shiny round beetle and it just started to fly. Anyway. We'll put that uh, in front here. Now, if you want to pull this frame out, the best thing to do first is to add a little bit of smoke there just to uh, clear the bees out of the way. So I'm going to go down in between the frames. And the reason why we're pulling out this frame is just out of interest. This is the one we harvested last week. So let's just, for fun, have a good look at what the bees have done to it in one week after the honey's been harvested. So I've got a bit of smoke down between the cells. And now we're going to get our hive tool 
and I'll show you where the lifting points are. There's one here under the frame used with the J, there's one here under this end used with the chisel end, and there's one at the bottom here. So it's about just loosening it up. If it's the first frame in the hive, things can be a little bit tight with propolis uh, and wax, and uh, you'll just have to chisel it out a little bit. So we can get under the top here and just lift it a little bit like that. And uh, what we've done is we've just lifted that frame and now we can get under this end. Sometimes they're a lot tougher than that and you have to work at it a bit more to get that first one going. And then we're going up. That's it. So look at that. The bees have completely stripped all the capping off. Last week this was full and you can watch that harvesting video. They've gotten down there, they've reused the wax they've, they've pulled off for the capping, they've joined all the cell parts together. Pretty cool. And that was a real win when we were inventing the flow hive because what it meant was uh, we didn't have to build in-hive decappers. If you're familiar with the conventional way of harvesting, you take the frames out, you take it to a processing shed, you get a hot knife and you slice the wax capping off. Now we were trying to build contraptions to do that in the hive, but luckily we actually didn't need to because the bees are so clever, they notice once the honey's drained out from the frame that the, uh, the cells are empty and they will take the wax capping off and reuse it. So that means uh, it's a much uh, less complicated mechanism. I did have all sorts of capping pieces that would move away from the front and all sorts of designs at, um, at one point. Hey Cedar, just while you've got that frame out, would you mind showing, because this is a pretty common question we get actually, the, the, the blade, some people think that when they've got it like that, they think, oh, there's something wrong, the blade, the, they're not all level, they're not all even. I know it's a little bit tricky to see it maybe on the camera, mm. um, but it's a really common question we get. People think there's a fault with their flow frame. Okay, I'm just going to put that upside down because it'll sit there nicely. Um, so. What they're talking about is this step here. So you've got in, then out, then in, then out, then in and out. If you look back to last week's video, you'll see that this was a flat uh, area of beeswax with the, with the hexagon imprints, and that was their capping over the top of the cells. So what they typically do is they build their cells out further. They attach to these flow frame pieces and they build their wax cells out further, and then they put their capping on. So the reason why every second one is stepped in is that's the one that moves. And we wanted to have the moving one deeper within the honeycomb so there's less, disturbing to, less disturbance to the capping section the bees are standing on. So that's the reason for that step. So uh, perfectly normal. Oh, that's great. And thanks, Callum, for zeroing in on that. I think it's a, good, it's a really popular question. Okay, so let's have a look at this next one, which is actually full of honey. Despite having the, the bees have removed the honey from the end here, the next one is full. So that's another reason to check if, you, if you're twiddling your thumbs and wishing you could harvest some honey, then maybe just check in case actually the majority of the frame is full. When the flow comes back on again, they'll fill up this window and give you a much better indication of when the hive's full and the, the flows there but if you're getting impatient you really want some honey then you can just pop the lid and just have a little bit of a squiz in here to see uh, if indeed there is some harvestable honey so let's just have a look at this and see what's going on typically when they're hungry what you'll find is in the center they'll start eating some of the honey away so when they are a bit hungry and you know there's not much of a flow you're actually better off harvesting the ones towards the outside of the hive okay so I'm now levering this one up to have a look at that. And what I'm seeing is one beautiful frame of honey here. Look at that, they've, they've, they've not filled the extremities here, but all of the rest is nice and full with honey. It looks like it has been for a while, judging by the color of the capping. It's whiter when they first put it on, and then it gets darker with all of the bee footprints. You'd think they'd wipe their feet on the way in the door, but no, they bring in uh, dust and things from the environment and walk all over the surface of their wax and it actually changes the colour of it. 
Fantastic. Cedar, Helen was asking, any tips on um, wanting, she wants to move her hive, any tips on moving your hive? So moving your hive, it depends a little bit on how far you're moving it. So the, the thing you're dealing with with moving the hive is the way they geolocate. These bees know that this is their hive and that one's not. Now, on a windy day, they can get a bit lazy and can't be bothered flying all the way down the row and they might go into that hive, but generally they'll stick to this one and they know that this is their hive. So if you grab this hive and move it over there, the bees will get quite confused and they'll come back to this spot going, where's my hive, where's my hive? And they're so accurate that if you do want to just move them little bit by little bit, then you can only move them a metre or two at a time. So you'd shift it just a, a metre and then wait a day and shift it again and wait a day and you can creep it across your yard like that. So for a small move, that's a good idea. You might want to put it on a trolley or something so you can easily move it each day and you can get it to the other side of your yard and the bees will slowly follow. If you want to move it further than across a yard then there's two techniques. One is to move them so far away that they can't remember where they are. So that would be um, six miles, ten kilometres away or um, and they won't actually then remember the spot you leave them there for enough time for the foragers to change over and because they're the ones that really know where the location is, the ones that are flying. So you leave it there for, for a month and then you move it back to the new location which might be a few hundred metres away and that's conventionally how it's mostly been done. However, there's a hack if you want to move it across the yard without doing that double move or you know a hundred metres away or something like that. then. Or, or even if it's just a kilometre away, but inside that six, uh, six mile radius, you want to move your hive, then you can just pick it up and move it. What you do is you block the entrance early in the morning. So most of your bees are home. You strap up your hive, you load it onto a trailer or the back of a, 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 tr a truck, and then you drive it to the um, new location, you unload it, you, um, and then you open the entrance. Now if you just open the entrance and, and that's it, what will happen is a whole bunch of bees will go out foraging and go and recognise the landmarks and fly back to the original spot, even if you've moved it say four kilometres away. The, a whole lot of the forager bees will come back to this spot here. So the hack is before you open the entrance you put an obstacle in front which could be a, a t-shirt taped around the hive, it could be a whole lot of foliage that you've broken up and put there, something so when those forager bees race out of the hive they crash into the foliage and go hang on something's different, something's changed and that triggers them to do a reorientation flight. So that can be an easier way to move them shorter distances however you'll still get five percent of the bees returning to the old spot. So you can either if there's other hives nearby you can just let them find other hives or you could put any box, a cardboard box or whatever here, collect those bees and ferry them to the new location every couple of days. So, <laughs> so there's, a, uh, there's a bit of a hack there, so you can decide which way you want to go. We've got um, more in-depth videos on how to do this at thebeekeeper.org and there's a whole online training course there. It's also a fundraiser and we're planting we're halfway through planting a million trees this year from, from that fundraiser, so we're pretty excited about it. Fantastic, Sita. And I, uh, uh, Beja and I were both a little bit distracted because I don't know if you remember last week, but the huntsman spider in the hive, it's actually come, gone under your little zip on your hood. Oh, it's under here? It's under there. Oh, let's have a look. Apparently there's we, a spider under here. We were getting distracted. It was, yeah, yeah. It's, it's just on this this side of you, yeah. And then? Under, under your little, under, pull up uh, that Velcro and there yeah. it is. It's the one that was in the hive. There it is. Ah, uh, huntsman. <laughs> Well, it's a baby baby, that yeah. one. Yeah. So they get as big as your hand and really hairy. And people who have arachnophobia freak out at them, but they're actually a pretty friendly spider. I have been nipped by them, but it's pretty rare. and They don't have any poison. <laughs> I could just see it going across your, your veil there, Cedar. <laughs> oh, there we go. Yeah, it just jumped off. It's gone. Okay. All right, sorry about that, to be distracted. <laughs> we were getting uh, distracted. 
So, and the next one it looks like has got honey as well. So what we're seeing here is quite a bit of honey in the middle of this box, which is a great thing considering we're in our winter here. What I'm gonna do is put this back together. We had a little look at that one. That was a nice capped flow frame. So that goes back here and I'm just gonna show you some tips on getting your frames back in. Now, if you just put your frame in like that, you wanna slide it across and you wanna slide it forward. So you make a nice flat window here and pull in the bottom. What we're trying to get is all of the frames themselves make up this nice end frame observation window, which is a really useful observation window. And uh, there's an adjustment screw at the back to help push it that way, or you can just push it that way and the bees will sort of set it in place with their wax. So the, the last frame can be hard to get in. So the way I usually do it, I might just shake these bees off. And if you're gonna get bees off something, most things in beekeeping are nice, slow, gentle movements. But if you're trying to get bees off something, then you usually give it a good whack and that will actually get a lot of bees off it. And that will just mean, as we're putting it in, got a little bees off one side. <laughs> uh, we can uh, do it without, you know, if you've got a whole lot of bees and you're pushing down between frames, you can sometimes damage the bees. So I find the best way is to put it up on its end first, put this here like this and just roll it into place. And that way it holds the position between the two frames without what sometimes happens. And these end plates jumping over each other. So I'll do that now. I'm going to push that one across and roll it into position like that and then go down. If you find it's getting tangled up and won't go down, just pull it out and try again. So that's pretty good. I'm just um, at the back here. I'm hitting just this side rail. So move it over a little bit and then push it down. And now you can see it's got a nice flat window, which is important. If they're too far out of line, bees can escape there and so on. So that's how you do your flow frame inspection. Not something you need to do every time before you harvest, but you can do it as a, as a learning tool to find out what the observation windows on the side and the back look like and what that means for your bees and your honey. It does differ a bit. Some bees don't like filling the edges like Trace's bees. Yes. And, uh, and other bees really like to, to uh, fill it all out. So sometimes uh, it's, it's occasionally you get a hive that this observation window isn't as useful to know when to harvest, but mostly it is. Okay. Uh, what we're gonna do now is take this box right off and we'll do We'll have a look, it's pollinator week, national pollinator week here. We wanna get into the brood nest and see what these extraordinary pollinators are up to. A hive like this could pollinate 50 million flowers a day. And that's why humans have dragged them all around the world wherever they've gone. Apis mellifera, incredible pollinating species, really important part of our human food chain. So thanks to the pollinators. Yeah, and on that note, Cedar, we've got a comment coming in saying, since putting a flow hive in the garden, we've noticed so many more native bees sitting up in our garden too, alongside our European bees, especially the leaf cutters. Is this common? Nah. How good is that? Well, it's very common that people really start noticing bees when they become a beekeeper. Not, not only that, we get these beautiful stories of people really noticing what's going on with the pollination and what's going on with the seasons and noticing that trees flower that they didn't notice flowered before and, and running around the block converting the place into a bee friendly zone and all of, all of this. So it's a wonderful thing to really tune in and see what's going on. As to whether putting your beehive there has attracted more native bees, um, not sure. I haven't heard that that, um, that happened so much, but uh, it could be that you're really tuning in and looking out at what's going on in the flowers in your garden. So now I'm just loosening up this box here to see if we can lift it off. So your chisel end goes under like that. And once you've got it loose, you should be able to lift it. 
Now this has still a fair bit of honey in it, so it's going to be heavy. If your back's a bit frail or you're not that strong, then get a hand uh, and um, that'll help to lift a box full of honey. You could harvest the honey before lifting, that would help. Or you can, as we were doing, take some of the frames out, which will make it a lot lighter as well. So you get roughly a full frame will be four kilograms. So it does add up in weight. Yeah, so how heavy do you think this box is, see? Uh, well, I'd say mm, 13 kilograms, mm. about as heavy as my daughter. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just going to put that on its end like that. Why I'm putting it on its end is if you put it down, face down, you'll end up with a situation where some bees will get squashed because there's a lot of bees underneath. Now I could add a little um, smoke there because I'm noticing they just got uh, changed their tone and got a bit more erratic in their behavior. And we haven't added any smoke for a while, so I might just calm them a little, just with some gentle puffs like that. At first it'll agitate them, but then they'll calm right down. Yeah, now, notice the sound change. Now it's typical at this time that you run out of smoker fuel. So don't forget to pop the lid and get it going again. So we'll do that now. This can get hot, so use your gloves or your hive tool. Pop the top off like that, you press it down, and then you can simply just add some more. Whatever you've got around, straw from the garden, pine needles work quite well. And uh, try not to burn yourself. And away we go again. Okay, any more questions coming in? Yeah, so it's Daryl's um, in Brisbane and has had the flow hive set up for uh, the last month. Um, and has a beekeeper all lined up to supply a nucleus of bees. His question to you, Sarah, is when would you suggest getting the nuke? He's in Brizzy. Okay, I would say whenever you can get it. So get in line, get your bees ordered as you've done, that's great. They, um, a nucleus is a going little hive, so you can just have it in your yard, it'll do its thing, and when the flowers are, uh, are coming, which will probably be in August in your area, then uh, they'll really boom then. So you want to make sure they're transferred into your new hive by August, but you can just leave them in their little box and wait. Take some advice from the bee breeder. So I'm looking at this excluder, wondering if the queen might be up there. Occasionally it happens, and I don't want to orphan her from the hive. So what I'll do is I'll just lean that excluder up so she can walk back into the entrance if she needs to. I can't see her there though but it's a good habit. Now, there's been some uh, spring management here already, um, even though we're in our winter, and some fresh frames have been put into this hive here and here. I can see by the different coloration, but also if we pop one of those frames out, there's not much going on on those frames yet. So we'll probably find that as the uh, the months head towards spring here, they'll really pick up pace and start to fill out these frames. So that's what a brood frame looks like when you've nailed it together and first put it in. And this is what it looks like when they're just starting to do their natural comb. So the way we often do it here is just with this starter strip that we supply, you put that in and you can see the bees doing a beautiful job of festooning, it's called, where they hold hands and feet like this. And what they're doing is a scaffolding so that they can uh, build their comb. And if I just move them off this little piece of comb, there's a very starter bit of comb there. Look at that beautiful little bit of starting. That's where they start and they build out from there. And hopefully they build nice and straight on this frame. If they don't, you've got to get in there and push them back in line if you're using naturally drawn comb. Now I'm looking at that wax, it's not bright white. So that means they're recycling wax, which also means they're not getting enough uh, nectar in order to make, the, make new wax. So they bring in the uh, nectar and they will actually um, use the, the carbohydrates to excrete wax. So they have a wax gland and they'll excrete the wax, grab it with their mandibles 
and form it into these amazing hexagons, which is a miracle in a way that they can do that. So we'll put that one aside on our frame rest here. The way I do the frame rest is I just rest it right on top of the higher lumps. And that way you can fit three frames on there. This is our shelf bracket for harvesting, but it also doubles as a nice frame rest. So out of interest, let's pull out the next one that has also been put in more recently. And I'm just going to move some bees off just where I want to work because that way I won't squash any as I, as I lift it out. So I'm going to go crossways first so I can see that they've started building on this and I don't want to squash their work. So I'm going to make a little bit of space here so that when I, I uh, bring this up, it'll come up nice and clean. Also, if you don't um, prise the frames apart, sometimes you'll pull out the nails. Okay, so this one, the starter strip wasn't glued in and it oh. fell right out. Oh. So there we go. It's always good to remember to glue your starter strip in, but it matters not with this frame, they're still building nice and straight, probably because it's in between two other straight frames. So it's a nice thing to do if you're putting in fresh frames, is put them in between two other ones, if you can, and that way you don't have to worry too much about keeping them in line. So we don't need that strip anymore. What you can see here is they've built a bit of comb in this area. See that? And they've been using it for brood and it's been through a number of brood cycles because I can tell the color of the wax is already darkening. So what you've got here, I might just move a few more bees away so you can see. What you've got here is brood. You can see that color capping and then you've got honey over here brood, honey, and then in between you've actually got pollen. Don't know if you, give us a thumbs up if you can see that on camera, if you can see the pollen down the cells. It looks a bit different, you've got a few colours there, and, and that's the fermented bee bread we were talking about earlier. So it's a nice little show. But over here you've got the white wax that we were also talking about. So they are bringing in some nectar, so they've been able to create this new white wax here can be bright yellow or bright white, generally bright white, when they've used it for the first time, so that's virgin wax. Very cool. That's amazing. Amazing to see them how they've done that seeds without that comb guide, isn't it, as you said? Yeah, yeah, they've just um, got, they're very sensitive to the spacing in the hive, so if you get the spacing right and you're between two other straight frames, you probably don't need the comb guide. But interesting to see how much is going on on that one frame. Virgin wax, older wax, brood, pollen, honey. What else can we see? Any more questions? Yes, yeah, so it's um, Eric saying, um, I think I've got your question right here, Eric, but basically his hive swarmed, but about 15% um, of the bees stayed. He's just wondering, will the new queen um, feel the same about the hive? the fact that so many have swarmed? Like, will she just keep building up? On the pollination uh, week, we've got beautiful orange pollen balls on the back of this bee. Just got camera shy as I started talking about her. <laughs> anyway, look at that. Beautiful orange pollen balls. Sorry, that question again, Chase. Yeah, so Eric, hive swarmed, about 15% of the bees stayed. The question is wondering, will the new queen feel about the, feel the same about the hive now that a lot of the bees have gone? Well, I'm not sure how the queen feels, but the bees will raise a new queen and that'll be their queen. So they'll, they'll know the pheromone and the queen won't know any different because she'll be a new queen and her job will be to build up that hive. So if the nectar allows, she will emerge out of her cell and in the first week or two, depending on the weather, she'll go on the mating flight and she'll mate with up to 30 drones and maybe a couple of flights in that week. And then she's got enough sperm to last for six years of laying. And she'll lay up to 2000 eggs a day and when she's in full swing and that will 
mean there's a lot of new emerging bees into the hive as, uh, and your hive will really build up. So hopefully the new queen that they raise will be a, a good layer and with some good genetics with any luck, it's a bit of a wild card. Um, the good genetics will be nice and gentle to work with and, and uh, nice hygienic bees that uh, keep the hive clean and free from disease and, and, and things and uh, also good production. So it's, um, the bees will just raise a new queen and she'll take over the old queen's job. It's the short answer. Great. Oh. <laughs> Cedar, um, Bevins and Mackay in Queensland here in Australia, just wondering how many seasons do the frames last until they need to be pulled out um, and cleaned, or do they need to be cleaned? And if they do, what would you recommend cleaning them with? Okay, so I assume you're talking about the flow frames. Yeah, the flow frames. So flow frames, we've found they're pretty hard to clean with. Um, we've tried all sorts of solvents and stuff. And you know, a lot of them you wouldn't want to put on your frames anyway. So I wouldn't bother with, with using solvents. What I'd do if you really want to clean them, and it's really, people have had them in their hive for five years or so, start asking that question. Now, what you could do is take the frames out and you use a hot water pressure washer. And your temperature's really got to be up at that, above the wax melt temperature of 63C. So you want it about 70 degrees or so. And that way, the, the combination of the pressure washer and the heat will strip a lot of that uh, wax off and you can go again. Now, the bees generally look after the frames in the hive, but you can get into situations where um, perhaps the cells aren't closing properly anymore, or perhaps, um, you know, when you're last harvesting, the cells are sitting up a bit and there's a bit of a gunk build up. Um, and you might want to give them a bit of a clean. Also, you might um, be missing that beautiful window that's nice and clear when you first, uh, uh, the bees first start to use it. And after a bunch of years, you can get a bit um, clouded over and you can't actually see what the bees are doing as well. So you can give the, the clear window part a really good clean as well. Now you can disassemble your frame to do that, but it is not as easy as I make it look in the video <laughs> of taking the wires off and putting it back together. But th there is a, a uh, disassembly video somewhere there for the frames. Great, but will the bees also help with the housework? The, um, the, the bees generally will just keep using them and using them if you just leave them in the hive. So if you're not bothered by the clarity of that back window, then you can just leave them in there and the bees will just keep using the frames. Unless you've got any issues, you may as well just keep using them and keep harvesting honey as the seasons go on. Nice. We've got a uh, beautiful show of pollen there. Just at the tip of the tool, you've got an orange pollen. Then you've got a, a whitish one. Up here, you move into reds and brown tones, just depending on what the bees were collecting from the flowers at the time. So different flowers have different colors of pollen. And uh, it's really important they collect a variety because pollen is their protein. And like humans, if they eat one source of protein day in, day out, they'll get sick. So you've got to mix it up, different sources of, of protein for a balanced diet. And that's why it's so important to plant that habitat for the bees. We're uh, in this situation with humans in the world where we've taken away so much habitat, we need to be putting it back for all of our pollinators, for all of our species to survive. There's countries where bees can't survive anymore in some parts, and they're pollinating flowers with feathers by hand, and that's not where we want to be. We want to keep our pollinators alive save some species from the brink of extinction by planting the habitat. And that's why we've started the beekeeper.org to raise those funds and plant a million trees this year because that's what the bees need. Good one. Let's right. pull out the next frame. Any more questions? Yes, yeah, Cedar Margie um, is tuned in. I think must be, she's saying she's just down the road from us, so I'm not quite sure where you are, Margie, but welcome. 
Um, just wondering, she's wondering if you can steal a jar or so of honey from your hive if your frame is not full. Um, harvested it about a month ago, but just wants a jar out of it. You can. So if your hive isn't full with honey and you're, and you're a bit unsure whether you should be harvesting, then the flow frames are quite versatile like that. If you want to harvest a small amount, and we showed you how to do that about three weeks back, I think. You just insert the key in a little way, turn it, and uh, it, key all the way will harvest one frame. So one sixth of the hive. Key in halfway in a frame will harvest one twelfth of the hive. And, and so on. So you might just want to go in a quarter of a frame, turn it and collect yourself a nice little jar of honey and take that back and leave the rest for the bees. So that's something you can certainly do if you're worried the bees don't have enough stores. Right. So this is, um, just for people who are tuning in a bit late, it's a classic hive with the six flow frames. How many brood frames are in this hive? So the number of brood frames in a what we call a six frame classic is eight. So flow frames are wider, brood frames are narrower. So eight brood frames, six flow frames, and that's a flow hive classic six. And then we have the flow hive classic seven, which has 10 brood frames, boxes a little bit wider, seven flow frames. Fantastic, just to clarify that for a few of our lovely beekeeping customers. And uh, last week we, we mentioned there was a special, wasn't there, Trace, on oh, the Flow Hive yes, Classic. Thanks. So, so that's, um, that's still going, I believe. Yep. yep, till the end of the month. It's on any of the Aracaria or the Australian Hoop Pine Hives. You get a $50 e-voucher um, or 50 euros depending on US dollars, depending on where you are. Um, and it'll be sent to you as an e-voucher on, I believe, in the first week of July. Um, and then you can use that to buy some maybe more equipment or put it towards another hive. So it's, it ends, I'm pretty sure, at the end of this month. So it's a $50. So anything on anything you purchase that's made from the Aracaria or the Australian Hoop Pine. Okay, good. So um, some people need a bit of excuse to take the plunge and yeah. you get into, into beekeeping. So if that suits you, then now's a good time. Okay, we're just stocking up the um, smoker. Um, closing the lid. And here we go. Yeah. So we're just having a bit of a look today. For those that are just tuning in, we're doing a brood inspection on the Flow Hive Classic and just having a look at what's going on in this hive. We've seen um, some beautiful work. It's National Pollinator Week here and uh, we're just appreciating the bees and the amazing amount of work they do. I mean, they produce this beautiful honey, right? But the fact that uh, one hive can pollinate 50 million flowers in a day, and that's a busy, good hive, is just extraordinary. There's no other insect on the planet that can do that for us. So that's why we value Apis mellifera, the European honeybee. And with this brood box seed now that you've got, does this, like, is this a standard amount of bees for a hive like this? So the, the numbers aren't uh, a lot in this hive actually, even though they look a lot here on these frames. This looks healthy and normal, but you'll find in the springtime when the flowers are really kicking in, the numbers will actually double in this hive. Wow. And they'll be spilling out the front, and that's the time when you want to be taking your splits or adding more boxes. Fantastic. Gary's asking, Cedar, will, will bees move honey from the brood box to the honey super to make more room for brood? They will. They will. So they generally do that um, unless there's no space to move honey. And that's when you, it's called honey bound, where there's not enough room to lay uh, new eggs in cells because their bottom box is filled with honey, top box is filled with honey. It's taking up all the room. So good idea in springtime to harvest a bit of your honey if your hive's full, to allow them to move some of the honey up from downstairs here and free up some space for the queen to lay again. Fantastic. So are you hoping to spot the queen today seeds in that brood box? Ah, I haven't um, been thinking about the queen a whole lot, but she need. could be here in the, in the centre. It's when you need your sister Mira here. She's, yeah, she's queen the queen spotter. spotter with her nifty little camera. 
Hilary Kearney has a great book called Queen Spotting, which really helps people hone their eyes more. Kids love looking at it and um, spotting the queen. It's like, where's Wally or where's Waldo, it gets called <laughs> in the States. Here we go. You've got a, a bunch of orange pollen. It's a beautiful thing. And you've got quite a lot of um, honey on this one, which is a surprise. I think these frames have been muddled around last time it was inspected. I didn't do the inspection, but this is a honey frame that's towards the middle. I was expecting um, brood here. So um, this wouldn't be a bad one to put out by the edge, actually. The reason being is this has been used for brood a lot. And see how the cells are waxy and dark? Um, we could actually, uh, and they tend to put honey on the edges, so we could let them consume the last bits of pollen there. We would better check the other side. Can't see. Uh, looks like there might be some brood down the cells on the other side, just in the very early stages. So we wouldn't want to take it away now, or that brood wouldn't get to live. So let's transfer this one to the edge of the hive. And that way um, we can cycle it out Come uh, springtime, when we want to make some more room, we can just simply take this frame away or just chop out the wax and put the frame back in. And that way you've, you've uh, given them some fresh new area to create brand new wax on when the flow's on and got rid of some of the old darker wax, which is a good thing to do each springtime, cycle out some frames. So it's all right then, Seeds, to swap the brood frames around and not put them back in the same position? It is if you, if you are careful. So what you want to avoid doing is, you see how there's a bit of, it's built, built out a fair way here. It's right out to the edge. So you want to make sure when you put it in, that's not pressing up against another piece of comb or the bees won't be able to service that area. And the beetles will go, yee here's a spot we can hide from the bees, lay heaps of eggs, and it helps your beetles get a bit of an upper hand inside. Generally, if the bees can, can service all of the comb surface, then uh, if the bees can service all of the comb surface, then the bees don't, don't really get to lay, the beetles don't really get to lay, and your know, hive will stay happy and healthy. So I have had issues in the past where there's been a lot of beetles around, I've muddled frames around, I've pushed the wax up against each other, and that's actually um, cause that colony to slime out where a lot of hive beetle larvae have been laid where the comb is pressed together and it turns into a big hive beetle maggot nest instead of a, be uh, a beehive. So not fun to clean up. So that's the reason why when you're moving frames, just careful to look down and make sure the parts aren't pressing up against each other. You want to see um, six to ten millimetres of space between the comb surfaces. Good one. Nice. See, so Dee's asking, how do you swap out foundation frames for foundationless frames? Okay, well, there's, um, you could simply um, chop the wires out and use them as foundationless frames, or you could simply just uh, cycle them out towards the edge, make sure there's no brood in there, take it away and replace it with a fresh one you've made and the bees will start um, building foundationless. So you can mix it up, it doesn't really matter. My, my dad likes to mix it up a bit, he, he likes to put some foundation in and it's just to help get a nice straight start. I tend not to do the foundation thing, I got sick of uh, wax and wiring frames many moons ago and I really like the the naturally drawn comb because the bees can just do their thing in a natural way down here and size the cells for themselves which is said to have a health benefit and uh, although it's a little bit more work in the hive it's less work in preparation and I prefer uh, getting into the brood nest and marveling at the way they start building their wax and straightening it out occasionally which is the I guess the con of foundationless frames than I do uh, the sitting there late at night waxing and wiring frames so it's really up to you what you want to do and and you can try it out and see what works for you 
And is that the main reason, Seeds, why people do use foundation, to keep the brood frame straight? There's another reason, and that's uh, the, found, the wax foundation typically is set into uh, some horizontal wires. And what they do is they heat up those wires using some jumper leads from a car battery. And the comb then drops uh, the wax sheet that you buy from a, a beekeeping store, then melts into those wires. And then what you've got is wire reinforcing in the comb, which means when you take that frame and put it into a centrifuge in conventional beekeeping and spin it around at super high speed, it's less likely to blow apart. So you go and put foundationless frames in a centrifuge and crank it up to max and the, uh, the wax and comb is just going to fly everywhere. You can spin foundationless frames, but you've got to wait till they've drawn it all the way out to the edge and connected it to the edge. So that's the other reason the wax and wire is, the wire is reinforcement. And for that same reason, some people use plastic foundation sheets and that's quite common as well. So instead of um, uh, letting the bees draw their own, they'll put a, a, a foundation sheet made out of plastic and the bees will build off that. So that's very common. And you can buy completely plastic frames where there's no wooden bit as well. That's also very common. So uh, try it out, see what works for you. I find the bees like the naturally drawn the best out of anything. Uh, next, they would favor foundation, wax foundation. And last, uh, plastic foundation, they really um, don't like as much in my opinion. Okay, we've got uh, time for a few more questions as we start putting this hive back together. Now, um, the bees have been apart here. It's a beautiful sunny day. It's a mid-morning to mid-afternoon with not much wind. It's the ideal beekeeping day. So what you've got here on this lovely sunny day is perfect beekeeping weather. You go and try to do this on a grey day that's got a little bit of rain, your bees won't be so friendly. So it's a, a good idea to do your brood inspections on a nice sunny day if you can. Yeah, perfect day. Um, just a couple of notice seeds. It looks like, is the inside of this uh, brood box painted? Uh, yes, it is. Well noticed. So you can paint the inside if you want to, but you don't have to. Um, we often recommend people just leave it perfectly natural for the bees, but whoever was painting this decided to paint it which is a fine thing to do as well. So the Aracaria wood is one that needs to be painted with a good house paint, at least on the outside. And that'll help protect it. If you try and oil it, you might be disappointed after some time, uh, if you, especially if you live in those more humid and wetter climates, that it goes a bit mouldy. You get that black mildew on it. Now let's just have a look at one more frame before we put this hive back together. Now we've got a lot of brood on here, which is good to see. That's what I wanted to see, is um, brood all across the frame. Typically, if you wanted a really good look for pests and disease, you'd be shaking all of these bees off, so you get a really good look at all the cells. Nice, these bees are so calm, aren't they? They are being friendly about it, considering what we're doing to their yeah. home. So like, imagine if someone pulled apart your home like this. <laughs> you might not be so friendly about it. Got pollen down there. It's a beautiful thing. Look at that. Any more questions? Yeah. So it's just wondering, do people, like in our climate up here, here in northern New South Wales and Australia, do we, are we able to get honey through the winter season? Yes, we are. So on the coast particularly, you'll get honey in the winter if you're close to the coastline. If you're inland a bit, you might have um, a couple of months with no flowers. Look at that nice healthy amount of bees there. Beautiful. Nice. Oh, just a reply cedar on to the one about the leaf cutters, um, saying that they um, didn't have massive leaf cutters before the flow hive, and a whole wall of loganberries newly filled uh, have all been chewed into with the leaf cutters. 
Huh. So. <laughs> so maybe it started a frenzy of pollination yeah. and life in your backyard. How good is that? <laughs> <laughs> that is cool. Okay. Now, I think it's time to start putting this back together. I was tempted with that question about the queen to go searching through all uh -huh. of the frames, but I think we'll leave it for today. I'm very happy that there is a queen in here because I can see the very young larvae and the brood is all in, in good shape. So I know there's a queen, I don't necessarily need to find her. You usually don't have to find her. It's only if you're really um, requeening or perhaps uh, if you're taking a split where you, you're introducing a queen, you might need to find her. So next we've got to uh, put the hive back together and what we're going to do is just add a little bit of smoke just at these end bars as we pull them back into line so that no bees get squashed in between them. That's it there. And now we wanted to save this frame for the edge so we might do that. We'll pick up one of these uh, fresh ones and put it back in here. Now, this has been checkerboarded, it's called. There's another fresh one there. And um, so the reason why that was done was to make sure we get nice straight comb without having to come back and check that. So by changing it around, we will end up with, um, we'll lose a bit of that checkerboard, but I still think we can do it. If we go this frame here, which is showing brood and honey, we'll put this next to this other one that's uh, an established frame. And we'll move the end bars across again, again adding a little bit of smoke to make sure they're out of the way before we close the gaps. Smoke's a good tool like that. And then what I'm going to do is put this last one in between these two established frames. So, uh, because it's almost completely empty and that will help them just keep it nice and straight. Obviously when you're starting, you can't have, always have, if you're starting from a swarm or something like that, you can't always have frames to help guide the new ones. In which case you've just got to give them a good crack at it and check check regularly as they build and just make sure they're going straight. So what I'm doing now is making sure there's no wax pressing up against each other, which there isn't because this is a uh, frame that doesn't have a whole lot. Although right here I can see that there is a protrusion on this one here and here. So I've got to be a bit careful about this frame and how it interacts with this one. See that lump there? It's going to be pressing into that one there. So, we might not be able to do what we were wanting to do and put this frame in between that one. But what we could do is put this one, which doesn't have the protrusion there. So once we start muddling them around, we've got to really watch what we're doing. If you're unsure, just put them back how they were. So we're going to switch this one to here and that'll be a better match for the jigsaw puzzle. Any more questions? Yeah, so it's Gavin's asking, do you have an estimate on time saved for the bees not having to initially, initially build the cells when putting your flow frames onto your brood box? This must save them quite a considerable amount of time. I think one uh, it takes, they say, about seven kilograms of honey to make a kilogram of wax. So there's a savings there. However, I found when there's a flow on, bees are pretty enthusiastic to make wax. So I'm not sure that that comes into play in terms of um, saving time or not. The bees will make an incredible amount of wax if there's forage available. That's amazing. So seven kilograms of honey to make one kilogram of wax. Yeah, so they, it's made out of carbohydrates and they've got to take all the water out and so on. So 
they've, uh, they're using the carbon chains in the sugars to make what's almost like a, a, uh, a fossil fuel-like substance with the, the wax. Yeah, you know, Paraffin wax is made from the uh, petroleum, and bees are doing it from sugar. Pretty amazing, but we do it in our ears for our wax glands. <laughs> Not as nice wax as this, but you know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, I eat a lot of carbs. I don't know if I'm getting a kilo of wax out of my ears, but. <laughs> okay, so which frame next? We've got checker, checker, checker. Um, we're missing a frame. Where did it go? You got the, two there. There, yeah. there it is. <laughs> okay. Beautiful. So this goes in the hive. So we're just inspecting this flow hive classic today and answering a few questions as we do that. We're just doing it out of curiosity and also because it's National Pollinator Week. We're appreciating the incredible work these honeybees do for our food chain and also the amazing honey they can produce. Any more questions? Yeah, so it's just on. So once you put this hive back together again, when will you inspect it next time? Like how long will you wait? So, I'll wait, um, probably I don't need to inspect this one till, the, it, till I notice there's a problem and the bees are dropping in numbers. That'd be one reason. Or uh, in springtime when they start to overflow with bees, I typically get in there and take a, a, a split or add another box um, or um, at least do some swarm management. Swarm management in spring, what gets called spring management, is to do what you see uh, has been done to this hive and you're putting some fresh frames in the bottom. So you'd be taking some frames that are typically honey from the edge, enjoying that honey as honeycomb, putting back fresh ones uh, in, the, in the center here to give your bees a bit of space to, to lay. And that's the primary trigger for swarming. Um, swarming's a perfectly natural thing, but you can't always hang around all day waiting for your bees to swarm and then go catch them. So what you um, are often better off doing is taking a split, which will fix that issue, or adding some fresh uh, frames for the bees to draw some new wax and for the queen to lay in so that that trigger goes away. The other one is uh, harvesting a bit of honey from your hive as well. So good things to do in spring. So springtime will be the next time we'll be inspecting this hive unless um, we come up with an excuse to. <laughs> nice. So I'm moving these frames across so I can fit this last one. And this was the one I wanted to put at the edge because I want to cycle this one out. Um, so when you've got ones that have been used many times for brood and it's getting old and dark, not a bad idea to cycle them out. And uh, once um, all the broods emerge, which there isn't actually any brood on this one, but there is pollen stores, so I might let them consume them. And uh, then you can just cut out that wax, unless you like chewing on the pollen. It's a pretty interesting experience. Um, the bee bread is quite, um, uh, it's sour and sweet at the same time, pretty intense. But you might decide you want to take that and enjoy eating the honey and pollen. Although I did notice right down some of the cells there were some young larvae. So we'll put it on the edge, we'll let those bees turn into, let, uh, emerge into the hive and then we can take this frame out. Now I haven't got quite enough space here yet. Um, so what I'm going to do is lever the frames over just a little bit further. So I'm pushing them across to the other side there. And then I'm going to gently drop this frame in. See it? And our colony is back together. A little bit muddled up, but they'll work it out pretty quickly. Leave any excess space on the edges and press your frames together. And the reason why you do that is because bees are specific about their spacing. They want to draw their comb about that far apart. If you leave big gaps, they'll start building random comb in between two frames and then it becomes hard to service. 
Okay, so right. next we're going to put the excluder back on, but before we're going to do that, we will put this, uh, get our smoker going again. As I said, pine needles are great and easy to light, but they don't last very long. Throwing a pine cone in isn't a bad idea, so Trace is just getting me a little bit more, a bit more. Uh, more pine needles that should do us for the end of this brood inspection. And you can use just leaf matter around. Uh, some people buy smoker pellets. Um, but I tend to just use whatever I've got on hand, whether it be leaves or pine needles or garden mulch. And away you go again. So why I'm lighting the smoker again is if I add a bit of smoke around here, the bees will vacate from the area where I'm smoking and that will give me a, a strategic moment to put the excluder on and then the top box back on top of that. So here we go. Bit of smoke. There we go. Got the smoker finally going well. So it's got them mostly cleared. And put that on there. Like that. Line it up as best you can. And then it's a case of just dropping the super back on top. I can't see any bees on the bottom, so it's a good time just to lift that up. Now, as said, make sure you brace yourself. Honey supers can be heavy. And there's one bee I can see just here. And then down we go. And then it's a case of sliding it into position so you're lined up nicely and your hives back together. On top of that goes your inner cover. Before you do that, just make sure your flow frames are all in line. I noticed this one has just jumped out a bit because I tipped the box onto its end. So what I'm gonna do is just lever that forward and get it all looking happy again if I can. Before I can lever that forward, I'm gonna go sideways. There we go. Okay, then inner cover goes back on. Like that. And we're going to, uh, in this case, we're gonna leave the plug open there. Don't have to, but that's how it was when we got to this hive but you can close that off on the Classic by putting a brick or a piece of wood or something over there. On the Flow Hive Plus, Flow Hive 2, we have a, a plug that goes in that hole for you. And then on goes your roof. Thank you very much for tuning in and all your, your great questions. It's always a joy to hear how everybody's going and where you are in the world. And just make sure your roof is over the top of your box. There we go. Next, we've just got our key access cover here. To go on. And also our rear window cover. And you swing this into place and it holds both of them there. And last but not least is the window cover. You don't want to leave that off or if it's on the sunny side, the sun will beat in and warm up your hive too much. Good, good. Thanks for watching.